Good morning. Welcome to the Flora Methodist Church, a non-denominational Wesleyan church set right here in beautiful Flora, Mississippi, just north of our capital, the capital of Jackson and Madison County, just west of the Madison, the city. We're so glad you're with us today. We're going to have a great day, and this will be the third in a three-part series on the body of Christ, life in the body. And I'm going to go to the obvious scripture, and then a less obvious scripture, I think, is, says about everything every preacher would ever want to say. There's one of these passages in the Bible. I think there's, the Bible's full of them. But if preachers are worried about having to say, you know, direct things, they could just read it from the Bible and not comment because there's, the Bible's plenty direct right by itself. So we're going to look at both of those passages today, and I've got out two Bibles sitting next to me, and, uh, and then we'll talk about this a little bit. Last week, we did the body of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, and we had uh, just a wonderful outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and healing. It's just amazing how people... People who discover that there's healing in the atonement find healing for their lives. That when you really understand that Jesus died, he, he suffered, bled, and died for, for everything, for everything. And when, once you get that revelation, you know, Paul, Paul said something that you would never hear me say, but it's in the Bible. He said, many are weak or sick or die before it's their time to die because they don't discern the the uh, power in the Holy Communion. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So uh, we did that last week and I hope you found healing for your life in the, in the sacrament. If, if you didn't see it or, or maybe it, it slipped past you, I just invite you to go back and watch it again and uh, sit down in front of your computer with the with the elements, the uh, you know, some bread and wine, uh, saltines and grape juice, if you grew up in the church I grew up in, and just, you know, just receive, just receive. It is so important. The early church did it every day. That's their testimony in Acts chapter 2, every day. Some people do it once a year. Some people do it once a month. Some churches do it every Sunday. The early church did it every day. Friends, it is October the, uh, what is the day, October the 9th, and uh, we are just so excited to have you this morning. I, I, want to, I want to invite you to a couple of things. The first Sunday in November, we're going to have our Thanksgiving luncheon, and we're not having traditional turkey and dressing. We have got uh, a pig in the pint, a pig in the pint or pig and pint or something like that. Anyway, it's a barbecue place in Jackson, and they're going to come and cater it for us. And we're going to have every conceivable uh, accoutrement, every conceivable side with uh, that wonderful, that wonderful southern dish. And so, please, please plan on joining us. It'll be it's it's catered, it's free. You don't have to bring a thing, and you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to bring anything. You just have to come. And so, even if you're in your church. And you say, well, I don't belong to your church. I'll be in my church. I understand. But if you can get here, you don't even have to come to church. You can just come eat with us. But we would love to see you on that Sunday. And that Sunday, we're going to roll out the vision for our garden. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. I'll do it on video for the first Sunday in November. And I'll do it in person. And so we, we have that. A couple of weeks later, we're going to have soup day. We used to have soup day on uh i think it was the first wednesday of the month forever and then when the covid knocked us back we still had it but we just moved it to sunday and uh, younger our our uh, senior citizens ladies put this thing on and now it's it's more of a church-wide event anyway and it's just a wonderful thing and you you come by the church we're going to do red beans and rice this year so it won't be a variety of soups you come by have red beans and rice and you throw a little offering over into Kitty, and that money goes to provide uh, Christmas joy to, to folks in our area. And so we work in concentric circles. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the earth. And that's what we do. We do Flora, we do Mississippi, 
We do the United States and we do the world. We don't re rob Peter to pay Paul. We don't take out of this group to assist that group. We cover everything. And, uh, and if we have something that is presented to us, it's a mission that we feel like we can help. We don't say, hey, where do we cut? We just step out. We just do it by faith. And, and really, it's just been wonderful. And so this is sort of the new soup day starting, starting in the COVID year. And so this will be the third time we've done it on Sunday. And so we sure hope that you'll be there for that. We have lots of Christmas things coming up, and I'll talk to you more, more about that. This this week, you'll receive something in the mail from us, just just a little happy, just a something very small. And then in for your Christmas gift, uh, I, I really have something that I've just wanted for so long to to put in your hands, and we're just waiting for the time is right. So between Thanksgiving and Christmas or around Christmas or New Year's, you're going to receive a gift in the mail from us, U.S. mail, that you're going to treasure for the rest of your lives. And so what I want you to do is let me know where you live. I need your U.S. mail address. We have, I think, around 230, 235 households in, in, in our group. And some, some live right here in Florida and some live all over the United States. But, but I might not have yours. So... Make sure I have your U.S. mailing address. And, and remember this, that, uh, that we only send out blessings. We do not send out invoices. We do not send out appeal letters. And that's not what we do. And so uh, if you've been burned somehow, somehow you, you paid, you know, you put $50 into a mission somewhere and you got $500 worth of letters back asking you for more money, you know that that's just not a very good, worthwhile thing. Nobody here does that. And so our giving is 100% pure. And so that's the only reason we want your address is to put things in your hand to bless you, uh, not to bug you. And so that's our commitment, and, and we'll do it. And that's what we do, praise God. Friends, we're going to have a song. We'll go into the sanctuary, we'll worship a little bit, and then we're going to come right back here for the third and last installment of our series on life in the body of Christ. So if you, uh, each each sermon is is freestanding. So you don't you do not have to have heard the last two weeks to, but they do. In some sense, we build upon what we teach. But but uh, and and we do lots and lots and lots of series. I did a series on the biographies of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I tended to do that for. Uh, the first quarter of 20 or 2021 or 2020, I don't remember, it was, you know, a year or two ago. And the thing turned into about six months. And then I didn't even exhaust everything. I just had to change because I thought, well, maybe people want to move on. Uh, I, I, I don't mean move on from Jesus. I mean, study other parts of the Bible. So I, I did some, some teaching from the Old Testament. And, and, but, uh, and we've had different series all summer, all summer long. We're glad you're here today. You are uh, a blessing to us. I wish you were sitting right here in my office or right over there in my sanctuary, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'd love to see you right here online. So friends, let's go into the sanctuary. Let's worship the Lord, and I'll be right back here in about three and a half minutes. Praise, man. Take it away.
If you have your Bibles, let's go to the obvious body chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll begin with verse 12. And then uh, we're going to read, uh, th I think, three or four verses from Proverbs chapter 6. But the, the text we're using today is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This thing has been preached upside, downside, in and out, over, above, beyond, beneath, and and it's just been such a blessing in this is the central teaching of Paul's greater teaching on spiritual gifts. We're not doing a spiritual gifts today. You heard me read portions of this in, in the 17 and a half years I've been here. And those of you who are from here and, uh, and maybe even, even since the COVID when we started our online services, uh, we've, we've referenced these, but we're going to pull out the teaching on the body of Christ. It's lengthy, but I'm going to read from the NIV. It's about 15 or so verses. And so you can join me. Maybe maybe we'll read just a, a verse or two extra, but uh, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 11. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. We baptized eight last Sunday at uh, Carl and Casey's pool by immersion. And I, thought, I didn't think you Methodists do that. We, we do do that, and we did it last Sunday. I think that is around 15 or 16 this summer we baptized by immersion. Public professions of faith, baptism. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one Holy Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say, I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. The foot would be stupid to say that. But you can, you, can believe, you can believe something sincerely and be sincerely wrong. And so, and so it is. Look at verse 16. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would be equally stupid. It would not cease to be a part of the body because it's not an eye. Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, how could it hear? If the whole body were an ear, how could it smell? But in, in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Just when you think he could not find another way to say this, and, 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 and with all its built-in redundancies, you can see the, the apostle, the, Paul in this case, really feels the need to drive this home. 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. And the parts that we, not, that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And that is so deep and so, and so amazing and so wonderful that, uh, that I'm just going to let it stand on its own. There's no reason to unpack this in, in the next verse. So you'll understand as we read verse 24. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked honor so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, Every part suffers with it. You heard me reference this in the last two weeks. If one part is honored, then every other part rejoices with it. Now you, this is the last verse. I'm just going to add this in there. I want, I'm going to stop before we get into spiritual gifts because, because I think that can uh, overwhelm us. And I want us to get this part. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. All right. Now, let me read from, this will be the New King James Bible. This is Proverbs chapter six, and it is uh, a wonderful poetry, and it is so direct. Now, you can read this in the Living Bible or the New Living Translation or the uh, so, some paraphrased versions or even the NIV or the RSV, and, and you can lose a little bit of it. But it is it is it is more direct than it, it, it it's more direct in the New King James Bible or the King James Bible than it is in any other version because the King James just carries that wonderful poetry. If I'm going to read the NIV Bible, I'm going to read Leviticus in the NIV. You know, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, that kind of thing. I'm reading through these stories. But if I if I if I'm reading the Psalms. I want to read the King James Bible, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That kind of thing. So this is Proverbs, and it is uh, beautiful Hebrew poetry. So let's begin with verse 16. These six things the Lord hates. Nay, seven are an abomination to him. And so he's. this is poetry. He's not saying there are six things the Lord hates. No, there are seven. If he's, if he's just simply enumerating things, he would, he would have, Solomon would have just scratched through it and started over. But he wants us to, he wants us to catch the beauty, the beauty of holiness. And uh, it is embedded in this passage. Let me read this verse 16 again. These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. Here are the seven. These things are an abomination to God. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil. You see, these are a part of the body of Christ. Did you, did you catch that? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that amazing? A false witness who speaks lies, and the person, the Lord hates the person. You know, I know the Lord hates things, but here, and you don't find this very often in the Bible, you'll find it almost never. Not never, but almost never. You'll find the Lord hates him or the Lord hates her. It's usually the Lord hates uh, people. Who, the Lord hates lying. But here it's the Lord hates people who lie. And so that is very strong, isn't it? Because God is love, because God is love. So let's look at the very last one. And the one who sows discord among the brethren, the brethren are those who you go to church with, those who say nasty things about the people they go to church with. Yikes. And so we're set up here. We're set up here by uh, Paul's teaching on the body of Christ. He, he, he makes two statements in that, in that 
1 Corinthians 12 passage that I think that we just need to remember. I mean, we can hang our hat on these. You know, for better or worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to death us do part, these things are going to be true, right? This is, this is covenantal language. This is what he says. The covenant we have with God and the covenant we have with each other. The Spirit places us in the body. And so it's, it's God's providence. It's his grace. It's his mercy that places us in the body. And our obligations then in the body are how we relate to each other. And so if you would ask Jesus about this, what, what's the most important thing? If you, could, if you could just say, what is the most important thing? What's the most important commandment? Jesus would say this, there are two. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love each other. And love each other just like you love yourself. Isn't that amazing? That's life in the body. That's what we're talking about today. Here's the setup. We are in the body of Christ. That's the setup. We are in the body of Christ. You belong to me and I belong to you. And if you get cancer, I got cancer. And if you drop a bowling ball on your foot, I'm going to hop around. <laughs> and that's, it is, it is not this sympathy. It's empathy. We feel each other's pain and we rejoice with each other. Did you catch that? Jesus said that. And Paul says this. We have that witness throughout Scripture. When one of us is sad, we all cry. When, up, when up, one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. You call me up one day and you tell me I got fired from my job. I'm going to grieve with you. If you call me up one day and you said, I won the lottery. I, I, I'm a millionaire. I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm not going to fuss at you for buying a lottery ticket. Besides, nobody ever calls the preacher and says they won. And nobody ever calls the preacher and says they lost. But somebody's buying those tickets because they're selling the heck out of them. So, you know, that's your business. But I'm telling you, if you ever win, if you ever win it, you'll be the most happy person on earth. But And your wife or your husband or your children or whatever. But I'll be happy with you. I hope you win. Every time they announce those million dollar winners and, and billion dollar winner recently, isn't that amazing? Billion dollar winner. You know what I pray? I, I pray, I said, Lord, whoever wins that, I hope they love you. I hope, I hope they love you. I hope they I hope your people win. And there's I remember uh before we had a lottery in Mississippi, a lady in Jackson went to Louisiana to buy a lottery ticket. And she won a million dollars, a million dollars. And she belonged to a church that I attended, you know, sometimes on Sunday nights or something when we didn't have church in our church. And so I didn't know her, but I knew her pastor and I knew, you know, their church family. And uh, so I saw it in the paper that she had won. And they interviewed her and they said, what are you going to do with, with your winnings? And she said, the first check I wrote was to my church. She said, I paid my tithe. I wrote him a check for $10,000. And I said, that's the most wonderful thing I think I ever heard. And then I got to study it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, that's on that million man math I used to teach in school. <laughs> she won a million. A tithe on that's 100,000. And uh, so 10,000 of that would be 1%, not 10%. But I don't quibble. You know, I was I rejoiced that she wrote a check for ten thousand. She didn't write it to me, but it didn't need to come to me. She needed to give it to the church where she attended, and that's what she did. God bless her. Now that's the setup. We're we're set up right here. We are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. We're told that time and again. He's the head of the church. I want to say that a little bit. Talk a little bit about that in in just a minute because I think that's really. Uh, where I want this butterfly to land today. I know that my sermons tend to meander like, you know, like I call those chasing rabbits or chasing squirrels, but it's really more like watching a butterfly, you know, going around. And I know people who watch it at home say, man, I wish Scott would make a point and move on. So the setup is that we are in the body of Christ and we are the body of Christ. And so we can all say amen there. The problem is that we are fallen people living in the midst of, in the middle of our redemption, not at the very end of our redemption. And some of us are newly redeemed 
some of us are really struggling to live out the, the claims of the gospel, the claim that Jesus has on us through his blood. And so we are fallen people. We are, we are sinful people. And some of us maybe have been sanctified, like John Wesley understood, entirely sanctified. That that's not his idea of Christian perfection was not absolute perfection, but some of us can claim that. And I would say, yes. I mean, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that, that Billy Graham was entirely sanctified. If you were to ask him that, he would say, no, he's not. And but even that answer makes him. Uh, I think more qualifies him to be, for me to say sanctified. John Wesley said he knew a lady who was entirely sanctified, and I believe I knew who he meant, but I'm not, I'm not going to say, but it wouldn't matter. Whoever it was has been dead for 250 years, but it's just, I don't want to cause, you know, some kind of debate, but, but he never would say who it was because he thought the moment I pronounced that I believe this woman is living out the full sanctification of God's call on her life, the devil would come and try and trip her. And he didn't want to put any kind of undue burden on her or any kind or, you know, set her up for failure. So he said, I prefer just to pray for her, but he, he knew a woman. Uh, and I believe he was talking about a woman named Grace. That'd be a good name in it to, to be sanctified because we're saved by grace. And if we're sanctified at all, we're sanctified by grace. It's not of ourselves. It's 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 him. But we're fallen, and we're we're seriously fallen, and we're hopelessly fallen without the grace of God. And uh, I think of the singing Lefevers back in the day. It was a gospel group, and one of their sons, one in the in the family line, uh, carried on the ministry. I think he's still alive. He would be very old now. I think he's still alive, but. He wrote a song called Without Him. It's a little chorus, two verses. Without him, I would be nothing. Without him, I'd surely fall. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. But we're not without him. And so I would maybe add, add a third verse to that. Praise God, I'm not without him. Yes to, yes to what he said or to what he's saying. It's in our hymnal. It's even in the Methodist hymnal, if you can believe that. But, but praise God, we're not without him. Makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? But here, here's, the, here's the divine solution, I think, that, that we, need to, we need to hold on to. Uh, first of all, we are the body of Christ, but none of us is the head. I think we get into a big trouble with, with power and power issues. You read, there's a lot of books out now about abusive churches and abusive pastors and that kind of thing. Church pastors, that they, they abuse people or they exploit people for their, themselves. One of them is called Churches That Abuse. And, and in that church, in that book, he says some things about churches that, that do not abuse. And so that, that book is imperfectly written, but it is, it, is, it is a true thing. It is a true thing that churches can abuse people. And I think the abuse begins when people who are, who are important in churches, who think they're important in churches, or who have important positions in churches, when they themselves abuse people. So do you go to a church that abuses people? And they said, well, if you go to this kind of church, that kind of church, that kind of church, yes, they abuse. But that's, that is exactly the wrong way to look at it. Because churches themselves don't abuse people. Abusive people in churches abuse people. And you could be any denomination. You could be left wing or right wing. You could be liturgical churches. You could be high church, low church. You could be historic church. You could be at a storefront church. You could be in, 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 in a downtown church with all that you know, verbosity that they, that they advertise. <laughs> and, and you could be in, in a church that, up in a mountain that handles snakes and be in a perfectly lovely church or be in a really, really messy church, a hurtful church, a harmful church, depending on the people you go to church with. But the problem begins when people in the church start thinking they're the head. This is the body of Christ and, I, and I'm running the thing. I can't tell you how, I want to say uh, a dozen, 
I would say a minimum of a dozen times and a maximum of about maybe 30 times in the last 15 or 20 years, somebody has said to me, Preacher, you're the head of this church. I don't like the way you're running it. And I say, look, man, I don't run the church. The Lord has not called me. You know, in, in 36 years of ministry, 36 and a half years of ministry almost, I've never felt like I ran the church. One thing is we have church government in the Methodist church that I grew up in. And we have a bishop, we have a district superintendent, and we have lots of committees at the local church level and above the local church level, at the at the state level and the national level. And so it, even if I wanted to run the church, I couldn't do it. And number two, I never felt that was my calling. I always thought that Jesus should run the church through the power of his Holy Spirit. And our job as a pastor is to serve the church. And, and I do that the best I can, imperfectly every single day but the best I can. I will, I will never run the church. I'll never, I have Scott Carter Ministries, I don't run it. <laughs> you know, it just sort of comes to me what we should do and I just, and, and that ministry exists to serve the church around the world. And that's, and that's, and that's, I'm not blowing smoke, I'm just telling you the way it is. So friends, let me, let me say this to you sweet, sweet friends. Let me, let, me, let me say this to you. Uh, uh, when bishops or cardinals or popes, if, if you're in that thing, primates, some people call their church leaders primates. If anybody of any, a board of deacons, a board of presbyters, a board of elders, an administrative board, an administrative council, uh, uh, deacons, however you run, however your church government is, is run, uh, uh, if they, if, if the people who run it are, are not serving it, then you just have a whole big mess on your hands. It doesn't matter what your church government is. It doesn't matter what the polity is. And we just forget that Jesus is the head and we serve to please him. And we, we love him and we love each other. We serve him by serving each other. And so that is so important. Please, uh, well, if you don't walk away from anything else, walk away from this. Uh, walk away with this. You are in the body of Christ and you are the body of Christ, but you're not the head of the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what your title is. Right? You've heard the old saying, uh, uh, Pharaoh had a title, but Moses had a testimony. <laughs> you remember that? Herod had a title, but Jesus had a testimony. It turns out Jesus had a title too, but he's king, he's Lord, but he laid all of that aside. Pontius Pilate had a title. Jesus had a testimony. So you've, you've heard that before. Let me, let me, let's look a little, let's drill that a little bit further. Our job is to operate and be obedient as parts of the body. I like this idea of being a part of the body. And I think it is a, a fool's errand to decide what part of the body you are. Because the scripture that I read right here said, he places us in the body where he pleases. And... Uh, I had, a, I had a seminary professor who taught preaching and, and uh, he had uh, that little, what is that little thing that kind of in your stomach that explodes sometimes? What is that? Appendix. Yeah, he had appendicitis and so he missed about three or four weeks of school. And he's, he's a Texan, he's from Houston, Texas. He's a lovely, lovely guy, Houston, Texas. And... Uh, and so they brought in as his substitute another professor in the same department. It was, uh, they taught preaching, you know, the servant as proclaimer, I think they call that curriculum. And they helped us with our sermons. And by the way, they're brutal. Boy, you have never been brutalized until you preached in front of a, uh, <laughs> a room full of seminarians and seminary professors. Well, you don't want to make a mistake. Fortunately, I'm perfect, so I didn't have to worry about that. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm telling you, it's brutal. 
And so, but the, my, my professor was, was a lovely guy, you know, and he wanted to help you. This other guy, he was, he was, my professor was from Texas. The other guy they brought in was an older gentleman. They were both really too old to be there, but the older gentleman was from Michigan and he did not like my accent. And so he just, he, he read, he, in my sermon, he said, he said he agreed with what I said. He, he said, he gave me high marks on my sermon, but then he just eviscerated me for having a Southern accent. And he said something about the way CBS did it, and the way NBC and a this is years ago, 1980s, the way they did it is that if they found journalist talent, uh, talented journalist in, in the South, he said they moved them to middle America so they could learn how to talk and uh, before they sent them to New York to be their anchors. And uh, he said, you'll never be a preacher in Michigan with your accent. So my, my professor came back and, and he was meeting with us individually to catch us all up. And he looked at my sermon and he read it and he saw it on video, VHS back then. And he said, uh, he said, he was reading, he looked kind of confused. And he, and he said, what did this, what did Dr. So-and-so say to you? <laughs> and I said, well, he told me he didn't like my accent. And he said, I would never make a preacher in Michigan. And my, my professor said, well, that's his hang up because this guy's from Texas. He said, let me tell you something. If God wants you to be a preacher in Michigan, you're going to be a preacher in Michigan. Although I don't know why God would ever want you to be a preacher. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was so affirming. And, and so I felt good, you know, and, and they told us, they told us, you know, how we're to dress and all that kind of stuff. And they said, for heaven's sakes, do not ever wear a pair of cowboy boots in the pulpit. And all the, the preachers from, you know, this is a huge, sermon. all the preachers from, you know, from Texas and from Arizona and, and really throughout the South were just objecting. You know, they said, uh, they said, culturally, it's not accepted. And, and they said, culturally, it's, it's not only is it accepted, it's expected. You don't know what you're talking about. And so uh, the, the greater point, I'm, I'm whining now, but the greater point is, is that Wherever your place is in the body of Christ, God will put you there and equip you to be there. And so uh, find your place in the body of Christ according to your gifts and let that be your place. Now, let me get down to the rub just a little bit and I'll pray for you in just a second. The rub is, is an issues of authority. We're in the body of Christ, but who's the boss? I mean, somebody's got to run the ship down, down here. And so the, the way the Methodist church is set up, and it's the only church I know, I've been in it 61 years. I, 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 say, I, t I say from time to time, you've heard me say, starting back in May, that I was an ex-Methodist. The truth is I'm a retired Methodist. I, I, I retired after 36 years in the Methodist church. And this church I pastor now is not in the Methodist connection anymore. We have withdrawn, but I am technically a retired Methodist pastor serving a non-United Methodist church. So I know it's confusing. It means absolutely nothing. Only to say that the context that I'm sharing is, is I think, helpful for us to understand what God expects, to us, expects of us in terms of authority. And uh, being the third and last sermon of this series, I, I really want to drive this home if, if you'll just bear with me two or three more minutes. And that is the Methodist Church is set up with the idea of delegated authority. The bishop is the ultimate authority, and then there's a district, and then there's a local church, and it and the and the powerful he's the head, and and it flows downhill from there, and that's the way it works. And so we have a lot of people who minister or who execute their ministries or their executive responsibilities or their their duties as, as they see it, through the notion of delegated authority. That's fine, you know, we, we have, we're a democracy. We're actually a republic, a constitutional republic, which is, which is not a pure democracy, thank God. But, and if we ever become one, it's over for, for us as a nation. But let me, let me say this to you. The Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't encourage us 
uh, in, the, in the arena of delegated authority. The Bible teaches something a little bit different than that. I would say almost opposite of that. The Bible teaches functional authority. And your authority comes from, your, your personal authority in the church comes from uh, the, the way you function in the church. And the greatest of all is the servant of all. If you want to be the first, you've got to be the last. If you want to be the best, you have to be the least. That's how, that's how the Bible, that's how the Bible uh, encourages us to function and so, so what do you have authority over? What do you have authority over in the church? You're part of the body of Christ. There's, there's about 300 of us here in four. And how, who's, it, who's in charge? Well, what are we doing? What are you doing? How do you serve the body? And you have authority over that which you take responsibility for. And, uh, and that is, and that is the way the body of Christ should work. He's He's the head and we're the body. You know, I don't wear my wristwatch. I don't wear my wristwatch on my ankle. <laughs> I wear it on my wrist. It's a wristwatch. If every time you asked me what time it was, I had to pull up my pants leg and look at my ankle, you would think I was something was bad wrong with that boy. You'd say Betty Carter dropped you on, on your head when, when you were, you, that's not how that functions. I don't put my shoes on my hands. So how do you serve the body? That's the question. And the people in the church that take responsibility for things, that's where their authority lies. And... Uh, and so we celebrate that. And we work well when that is the way we work. But if you're assigned to a committee, to any board or any committee in the church, and you walk in there with a, with a clipboard and a stopwatch and a pen, and you start pointing at people, go over here and do this, go over here and do that, because I'm the chair of this committee, you're, you, are, you are ministering quote unquote, ministering through a sense of delegated authority. I'm the chair of this and you're going to have to do what I say. And, and I'm telling you, pastors can't do that. I know, listen, most pastors do that. The overwhelming amount of pastors do that. But, the, but pastors should not do that. Because pastors don't walk into a church with a clipboard and a stopwatch and a, an engineer does you know, at General Motors, but a pastor doesn't. You know what a pastor walks in with? A towel and a basin full of water. Jesus said, you want me to show you how you're to function? He said, take off your shoes, take off your sandals. And Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed their feet. He taught us, friends, to serve to serve. Jesus didn't walk in with a scepter and a crown and a stopwatch and a clipboard. He wasn't there kicking butts and, pardon, kicking people and taking names. <laughs> that just, that never entered his mind. Friends, it never enters my mind. I, uh, many, many times, too, too many for me to remember, people have said, I don't like the way you run the church. And I say, I don't run the church. I don't run the church. This is not my church. This is his church. You know what? You know. You know how I drive a church. If, if, to use that metaphor, let's. The, I, I use sailing because Jesus used it. You use sailing. You know what you do? You raise your sail, and the wind blows. Jesus said, "You don't know how the wind blows." He said, "The Holy Spirit's the wind. You don't know where it's coming. You don't know where it's going." <laughs> That's the mystery of the wind. He said, the Holy Spirit's just like that. We raise a sail, the wind blows, and the Lord, the, the Spirit of Jesus Christ is taking us where he wants us to go. I cast a vision and I lay it out before the people and, and we go with it and he blesses it. Did you know the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish? The Bible doesn't say where there is no financial plan, the people perish, Right? <laughs> And say where there, where there are, where there, where the committees aren't meeting on a regular basis, the people perish. Doesn't say anything like that. 
it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Hmm, how about that? Woo! So how does God, how does authority work in the church? It's, a, it's, it's all an issue of servanthood. It's not an issue of who's the boss. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of who's the servant. You know, who's cleaning the toilets? <laughs> You know, who's raking the yard? Who's uh, working as an usher? Who's singing in the choir? Who's playing the piano? Who's playing the organ? Who's playing the drums? Who's playing the guitar? That's, uh, it's, it's your authority in the church is uh, representative of your, or it, it's, a, it's a product of your, uh, your servanthood. What, what about that? You okay there? Well, let me end here. I would take it seriously when God says he hates something. You know, some things in the Bible, uh, you know, you're reading a verse out of uh, Leviticus or, or Deuteronomy or, you know, something in one of the prophets and you have no idea what he's talking about. You know, these prophecies are just so embedded in there. They're almost impossible to read. People just give up on the book of Revelation. I understand. That's fine. But what, but what if God is not mincing words? There are six things the Lord hates. Nay, there are seven. Oh, my goodness. A proud look, a lying tongue. And then at the very, the very last one, and we don't deal with that a lot around here, and so I've, I mean, I've been here since 2005, but uh, those who sow discord among the brethren, it's a troublemakers in the church. You know, you know uh, when you're taking your vitamins and all that, you take a lot of vitamin C and a vitamin D and that kind of stuff, and you're eating blueberries, or you're eating uh, those those uh, black beans, those those uh, fruits and vegetables that that are cancer fighters. You know, you're just trying to read up on that. I, I learned a word years ago. I'm you know trying to be healthier because I'm so out of shape. But, and that that is uh, the word is uh, or the term is free radical. You know what that means? A free radical. It's how people get cancer. And their cells, they have a cell that goes into rebellion against their body. And they call those little cells, those little rebel cells, they call them free radicals. And free radicals break loose and they cause cancer in the body. What's true in the natural is also true in the spiritual. And on occasion, we don't have them around here. It's very rare that it happens around here. But it, uh, but I've seen it a bunch and in, in I've been in church all my life. I've seen it a bunch and you've probably seen it in your church. Uh, but we have people that are free radicals and they cause cancer in the body of Christ. <laughs> they just go off on their own. And it's usually over an issue of authority. And if you want to, if you want to function with anything that resembles authority and, and, and you're not in submission to Christ or submission to the body of Christ. Uh, friends, can I tell you, I'm in submission to this body right here, to, the, to this church I pastor. And, uh, and I listen to them and they listen to me. And so we have a harmonious relationship. You do not go to a church like the Methodist Church and stay there 18 years. And uh, if, if you divorce, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You stay five years and then you go to the bishop and you beg him to move you. Let me let me tell you, friends, uh, the average Methodist preacher stays 3.2 years. The average Baptist pre preacher stays 1.6 years. It is really, you know, uh, there are hundreds of churches in Mississippi alone that don't have pastors of all denominations. And there are thousands of churches around the nation that don't have pastors. They, they Today, they don't have a pastor. Now we have a trouble with free radicals. They're not committed and submitted to, the, to Jesus, to his word, and to each other. 
The divine antidote to all of that is servanthood. The body serves uh, each other. If my face itches, my hand scratches it. You know, if I want to get up and walk across the room, my legs and my feet take me there. But once there's rebellion against the head, then we have real trouble. Let me ask you something, friends. Are you, are you committed to the servanthood that Christ calls you to? Are you committed to serving the church, to serving the body? Do you want to run the thing or do you want to serve the thing? Uh, let, me, let me just say this as bluntly as I can. If, if, the, if the good folks of Flora Independent Church, if they want to call a pastor, if they want a pastor who they want to come in and run the thing, then they need to tell me so I can move on because I'm never going to run a church. I serve the Lord and I serve the people, but I am not the boss. I am not the head. Jesus Christ is our exalted head. The, the, the scripture says and the hymn says, we're following our exalted head and we are, uh, and we are not in competition with our exalted head. Jesus did not step away from the throne so I can sit on it. I will never sit on his throne. Friends, I am just praising God that I'll be close enough on judgment day to see the throne. I'm certainly not going to sit on it. I just want to be in the crowd that sees it. I'm certainly not going to take his place. Are you ready to serve? I don't know what church you go to. Some of you go to mine. You go here. I thank God that you do. Some of you go to other churches and, I, and that's great. But I hope wherever you serve the Lord, you serve the Lord. <laughs> and I hope you don't, I hope you don't join, a, join a church to run it. I hope you join a church to serve it. And that is key to body life. This is the third of a three-part series on the body of Christ. I'm so glad you joined us. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for these beautiful people who are watching us today. Lord, I hope this video serves, serves everybody who sees it. And I hope, Lord, that we will just be very conscientious uh, that to be servants. Jesus said the greatest of all would be the servant of all. Jesus said, uh, if you really want to know what it's like in the body of Christ, watch this. And he took off his clothes, he strapped on a towel, he filled up a water basin, and he knelt, and he washed his disciples' dirty feet. Jesus is the greatest of all, because he's the servant of all. He is our, he is our servant savior, and he has given us the example. And Lord, I know that I'm unusually blessed to have a congregation where that's not an issue very often. But Lord, I pray, you know, not everybody who's watching this video comes here. They go to other places. And I know people are frustrated that, uh, that, uh, I, that I'm not more dogmatic in the things that I say and do, Lord. But uh, I just remember, I remember you, Lord. I remember you and you're the head, and I'm a part of the body, but I'm just a part of the body. No greater part or no lesser part than anybody that's watching this video, and you're always the head, and I will never be the head, and nobody watching this video will ever be the head. You are the head, and you are the only head. You are our exalted head, and we follow you. So Lord, I pray for those who are watching today who tuned in for a word of hope and a word of life. And there's been some stress, Lord, in people's lives and more stress is coming. And Lord, uh, our political parties have decided that the only way to get us to vote is to scare us. And so the news is just ridiculous. And so Lord, I just pray for peace for everybody who's watching. 
And Lord, I pray for healing for those, Lord, for those who tuned in last week and didn't receive the healing they were looking for. Lord, healing of their bodies or, or healing of a relationship or, or something like that. I pray for those who need a job. And I pray for those who have a job, but they don't make much money and they don't really have any benefits. And, and the people they work for are just awful. And they need a breakthrough. And so I pray for them. I pray for them right now in Jesus' name, I pray. Lord, I pray for those who are in a church where it, it, the worship is good, but the preaching's good, but uh, there's really something missing, Lord. I pray for them, Lord. I know what's missing. The Holy Spirit. We have decided in America in the year 2022 that we can have church without your Holy Spirit, without the Spirit of Christ. We can serve Christ. We can worship Christ without the Spirit of Christ. Lord, we have, we have done an amazingly stupid thing. And so forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. But I pray that you would lead and guide people directly into the churches where they need to be. Lord, uh, there was a time where people were bound to churches by their denomination or by what group they were raised with. And if you were raised Catholic or you were raised Methodist or you were raised Presbyterian or you were raised Baptist, that's the group you lived with. That's the group you died with. But that's a bygone era. And now people are, are hungry for something that's more authentic than that. Lord, they're hungry for you and some of them don't even know it. So I just pray for them, Lord. I just pray that you would reveal yourself to those who are seeking after you. I remember you, the words from the prophet Jeremiah. I think it's chapter 29 when Jeremiah says, where God says through Jeremiah, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And so I, I speak that to you. I speak that over you. Seek the Lord with your whole heart. Call upon him. He is near. He's going to reveal himself to you. Uh, for those who've given up on a miracle, maybe because there's been a death or maybe because uh, uh, hope defer deferred makes the heart sick. I pray for that person who is heart sick. Lord, maybe they didn't tune in last week and they didn't receive the sacrament or they, they weren't encouraged like in last Sunday, or or maybe they saw the video online and the and the service in person was so much more powerful. It's just sort of hard to worship through the internet. But I pray, Lord, that uh, for our shut-ins or for our congregation that watches all during the week, and maybe we have ten people that watch on Sunday morning, but by the end of the week it's fifty or sixty, and maybe you add up all of our. All of our platforms, we have three or four or 500 people that watch. And Lord, maybe the sermon is just bad, and so there's a disconnect there. But I just pray, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself through your power, through your love, through miracles, through answered prayer to each and every person who's watching right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I just cry out to you, bless my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Lord, meet every need. Lord, and, and not in the sweet by and by, not when we get to heaven, Lord. We'll have no needs when we get to heaven. Lord, I pray that you would bless my brothers and sisters here and now. That's what I pray, here and now, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, I'm so glad you're here. I love you. I will see you next week. I hope to see you here one day. And but I know you live other places. We have people who watch from Africa. I hope that you I hope to one day you know we'll see each other face to face. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye y'all.